In 2 John, we begin reading of verse 1, The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth, for the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Grace be with you, mercy and peace, from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another, and this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it, for many deceivers are entered into the world. Who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Last time, we took the time to consider what a walk in the truth looks like. All of those who know Jesus Christ are exhorted to walk in the sphere of truth. That is, we considered last time, we are to take the effort to continually and gradually Move in a direction that seeks a better knowledge and understanding of God and what is his will for us in the here and now. We consider the fact that a walk in the truth brings joy and encouragement to others who are walking in the truth. And it always entails love for others based upon what is best for them, namely faithfulness to God's word. For as verse six declares, the key phrase of this entire letter, this is love that we walk after his commandments. In our first three studies, we've considered mostly the positive aspects of truth. It's been a real joy to actually consider things that are so positive from the word of God. We've we've considered these positive aspects of truth. The fact that the truth unites. The fact that the truth brings joy to others who are walking in the truth. Yet now, in verse 7, the Apostle John turns his attention to his reason for writing this letter. He's already made it clear, as we, we noticed just from reading the first six verses over and over again, that love and truth are extremely important in the Christian walk. But he makes it clear that love must always be based upon the truth. This dear lady to whom John wrote, as well as the believers who comprised the local church in her house, they wanted to show love toward professing Christians who were coming into their assembly, but who were not propagating the truth. How should they deal with this particular problem? Well, This question and the answer that the Apostle John, through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gives is so applicable even to our lives today as well. What do we do with those who claim to be Christian and maybe even are fellow brothers or sisters in Christ, but whose doctrine conflicts with the truth of the Word of God? Is it loving To just accept them in the church anyway? To allow them to teach? To work with them? To minister alongside them? Simply because they claim to love Jesus? I think this issue, and as the elect lady and her children are communicating their concerns to John back in the first century, I think this issue is especially relevant 2,000 years later. I think it's a very important and relevant issue even today for several reasons. Number one, I think the first reason this is so relevant is because within the church today, we have this, what has been referred to as a hitchhiker mentality among Christians. It seems as though a a vast majority of professing Christians don't want to commit to a local church and its doctrine and its purpose and be united together in this. Rather, they want an eclectic diet of spirituality as they either hop from church to church or Bible study to Bible study or one ministry to another, even though they all differ in doctrine and purpose. I think this is so important, this question, this issue, because number one of this problem that we have in the professing church even today. 
Number two, I think it's relevant because we have a cult of personality problem in the church today as well. Many Christians who love the Lord and know the Lord, they just love certain Bible teachers. They have those those whom they follow. They're maybe locally renowned or nationally renowned. and, And these individuals measure everything by the teaching of their favorite Bible teachers. Technology has made it possible for Christians to attend a local church and and even measure the teaching of their own pastors by the teaching of their religious heroes. It's an issue today. Oftentimes, if their religious hero is named or criticized, they're offended, even if these men or women are not walking according to the truth. So we have an issue. It's a concern today. I think this question is very relevant today because we have an ecumenical spirit among churches and Christian ministries today. So many churches and ministries want to, they seek to join forces in a generic effort to preach Jesus, quote unquote, even though they don't agree on doctrine or purpose. What is the gospel? What is the church supposed to be doing in the world today? What's our very purpose as a church for our existence? How do we deal with those who don't teach the truth? And finally, I think this question and this issue is so relevant today because we have a self-focused theology of experience today over revealed truth. People are seeking an experience or a feeling rather than a solid understanding of what God has declared and what he has revealed. If one's feelings or experiences trump the truth, then often these individuals tend to go with their feelings or experiences over what God has declared to be truth. So this issue and this question is really important that this lady and the church which met in her house were facing. What do we do with those to whom we want to show love, but who are not walking in the sphere of truth? Thus, we have this warning this morning from the Apostle John, which is extremely relevant even for us today. Keep in mind, the Apostle John is writing to a dear friend whom he knew extremely well. I think part of the problem today lies in the fact that many who name the name of Christ and are teaching error through their books or radio programs or television shows or or internet ministries are targeting people who love the Lord and they desire to do right. But these false teachers don't even know or care for those whom they are targeting. They're renowned people who may even be evangelical or or fundamental in many ways, but there's no personal relationship with the one on the other side of the medium. John, on the other hand, genuinely loved this lady. He genuinely loved her children. He genuinely loved the church which met in her home. Thus, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he lays down the boundaries for true love. A walk in the truth. A walk in the truth. So as we come to verse 7, the conjunction for is extremely important. It sets up the entire remainder of the Apostle John's letter. John has already stated that love is vital in the Christian life. Love is absolutely necessary, but this love is not love as understood by the world. Rather, it is a love that can only be exercised and determined by the boundaries set by God himself. This agape, what is genuinely, truly best for another individual, not necessarily what they want or what they desire. This is love, John writes, verse 6. You're going to hear this a lot, as we have so far, that we walk after his commandments, that we walk in this sphere of truth. Therefore, to walk in the sphere of love is to know God, first of all, salvifically, trust him and him alone for your eternal well-being, what he's done for you, what he's accomplished for you on Calvary's cross. And then to walk in the sphere of love is to know God experientially. That is to have a relationship with him and then walk with him, measure every action and thought and belief according to the truth of his word. This is what is true love. This is what it is to walk within the sphere of truth in a manner of love. 
So I want to take a few moments with the, the, the brief time that we have today to consider what John has to say about these individuals who have entered into this lady's home, the church there, who claim to know God, but have departed from the truth. Now, Lord willing, next time we will consider what is to be our response to these people. What was the believer's response to these individuals to be? But today, I want us to just look at the the seventh verse and consider God's estimation of these individuals. The first thing we see from verse 7 is that John reveals the permeation of false teachers that would be a reality in the age of the church. Notice that second word in verse 7 Many. The permeation of false teachers. For many deceivers are entered into the world. Consistent with the totality of Scripture, John is divinely aware of the saturation of error among all who seek to walk in the truth. And you say, is this something new in the church age? Is this something new in the first century? No, this was true as well all the way back of Israel in the Old Testament. The saturation of error, a saturation of false teaching. God's people frequently listen to the words of the majority of false prophets rather than the minority of true prophets who actually spoke for the Lord. There are so many instances in the Old Testament. There are so many places that we could go back and find examples of God chastising his people for listening to the majority, to listening to the false prophets and rejecting the minority, those who truly spoke for the Lord. But let's just go to one place. Let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 26. In Jeremiah chapter 26 We need to notice this all the way back during the days of the prophet Jeremiah. We begin reading in verse one, in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, came this word from the Lord saying, here is the word of the Lord from the prophet Jeremiah to the people. Thus saith the Lord, stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak unto all the cities of Judah, which come to worship in the Lord's house. All the words that I command thee to speak to them, Jeremiah, diminish not a word. Don't change a single word. If so be, verse 3, they will hearken and turn every man from his evil way, that I may repent me of the evil which I purpose to do unto them because of the evil of their doings. And thou shalt say unto them, thus saith the Lord. Here's the message of Jeremiah to God's people. Thus saith the Lord, if ye will not hearken unto me to walk in my law, which I have set before you, to hearken to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened, then will I make this house like Shiloh and will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. Wow, that's a serious message from God through the true prophet Jeremiah to his people. Well, look at verse 7. Notice what happens here, though. So the priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. Now it came to pass when Jeremiah made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people. Notice, the priests and the prophets... And all the people took him saying, thou shalt surely die. Not just the priests, the prophets, the majority. Why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord saying, this house shall be like Shiloh and the city shall be desolate without an inhabitant. And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. Who was the majority here? The prophets, the priests, the people. Who was in the minority here? Jeremiah, the true prophet of the Lord, and all the people chose instead to listen to the majority false prophets than the minority true prophet. Verse 10, when the princes of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord, sat down in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. Then spake the priests and the prophets unto the princes and to all the people saying, this man is worthy to die. For he hath prophesied against this city, as ye have heard with your ears. Then spake Jeremiah unto all the princes and the people, saying, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house, 
and against the city, all the words that ye have heard. Therefore now amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God. The majority prophets hated the words of Jeremiah. They hated the one true word of the Lord. And we know from the rest of history that the people followed these false prophets who told them what they wanted to hear. Back in 2 John verse 7. For many deceivers, the majority, not the minority, the majority are entered into the world. It was true of Israel in the Old Testament. This was true in the first century. And I believe it's even more true today than ever before. If you look over at 2 Peter chapter 2, notice what the apostle Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 2. In just the first two verses, Peter writes, but there were false prophets also among the people. Referring back to what we just noticed in the Old Testament during the ages of Isaiah and Jeremiah and and all the false prophets, there were false prophets among the people. Peter writes, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction and many shall follow their pernicious ways. By reason of whom the way of truth, here's the the standard, here's the measuring straw, the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. 2 Peter chapter 2 here reveals just as false prophets existed in the Old Testament, false teachers will arise among believers within churches, within professing Christianity. And Peter says, many will follow their detrimental and exceedingly harmful. That's what the word pernicious means. Their detrimental and exceedingly harmful ways. And what we have here is an exponential effect as time goes on. Think about this. False teachers will increase. Those who follow them will increase. And this effect will only grow greater over time time. Even in the first century, Titus was addressed concerning this. The apostle Paul uh, wrote to Titus in Titus chapter one, verses 10 and 11, for there are many unruly vain talkers and deceivers whose mouths must be stopped. Paul addressed this as well to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13. In 2 Timothy 3, 13, Paul says, Evil men and seducers shall wax or shall grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. John is revealing here to this lady and reminding her and her children and those who met in her house as a local assembly of believers of the permeation of, of false teachers and false teaching. This wasn't just some shot in the dark, hit and miss. Every once in a while, there might be some bad guy floating around out there. John is saying there are many of these guys out there. Just like Peter has made clear, just like Paul has made clear. We can go back and see just as Jesus made clear when he himself walked the face of the earth. While John is certainly revealing the fact that many false teachers exist, I think more importantly, he's warning the believers about this reality. Watch out. Be careful. Don't do what everybody else is doing. Don't believe what the majority is believing. Now we're talking here even within the realm of Christianity. Be careful. John, why are you so negative now? Why are you being so unloving now toward these people, John? Understand, remember, what is love? What is love? This is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is truly the loving thing to do, for John to warn about these many false teachers that are out there. John is showing his love for this lady. He's showing this love for her children. He's showing his love for this local church by saying, watch out. He's warning them. Remember, agape is not telling people what they want to hear. But it's telling people what they need to hear for their own good and for the glory of God. I mean, this, of course, is going to bring scorn. It's going to bring scorn 
to faithful believers, it's certainly not the popular thing to do to have to warn, to have to be negative, to have to speak out at times. Yet the correlation is clear here, and we have to grasp this. True love means, as we're going to see, warning and separating. And this will not be popular among the majority of professing believers. Because many will follow these many false teachers who have entered into the church. So first we find John revealing the permeation of false teachers. Number two in our text, we see John revealing the subtlety of these false teachers. Notice the word he uses, the third word, for many deceivers. Now, we're not going through this entire verse word by word and taking this long on each word, okay? But get this. For many deceivers. See the subtlety? The key word John uses to describe these people is the word deceivers. In fact, he uses this word twice in just this one verse. We have the third word, and at the very last sentence, this is a deceiver and an antichrist. These individuals are not coming in to the assembly of believers in this lady's house as wolves. They're coming in as wolves, but in sheep's clothing. They're not coming in and saying, don't listen to John. Don't listen to that old guy. Don't listen to the other apostles. They're not coming in and just outwardly, overtly saying, don't listen to them. Rather, they're saying, you know, John's a great guy. He's put in his time. He has many good things to say, but, but. In today's terms, they're using the same words and language but with different meanings. Same words, same language, but completely different meanings. They are deceivers. They're subtle. Just like the God of this world, who is a liar and a deceiver from the beginning, Jesus says. Interestingly enough, Jude describes the false teachers in the book of Jude, that short little epistle that we looked at maybe a couple of years ago. Jude describes the false teachers as entering in, notice verse 4, unawares. Notice what Jude says in verse 4. There are certain men crept in unawares. Interesting. Yet he says these are great communicators in verse 16. They're murmurers, they're complainers, they're walking after their own lusts. But notice he says their mouth speaks great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Good communicators. They've, they've crept in stealthily. They've crept into the assembly saying one thing, but maybe different definitions for the same terms, saying one thing, believing something else. They're stealthily creeping in. They're creeping in unawares. And man, they're great communicators though. Paul says back in, we looked at the text, 2 Timothy 3.13, that these men are deceiving and being deceived. There's that word again. Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, we've already looked at this verse, that they will privately, that means in secretly, bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them. This is very interesting, this idea of deceivers. Again, every New Testament author is describing these false teachers, the many who will enter into the church and have many follow them, as coming and entering into the church stealthily, deceptively, craftily, subtly. Back in 2 John verse 7, the Greek word for deceivers here is the word planos, which means a wanderer, a roamer, a strayer. It's the same word Paul used, the same Greek word in 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, where the apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Notice this, Timothy some Christians will depart from the faith. They will do that. They will depart from the faith. This isn't talking about losing their salvation. The, the faith, the body of truth of which they have been entrusted. 
They will depart from the faith, the body of truth, and they will begin to heed and propagate false teaching that is generated by attention to seducing spirits and is described as doctrines or teachings of devils or demons. Serious. Very serious. Jude uses the same Greek root of planos in Jude 13, where he describes these false teachers as wandering stars. Remember when we went through Jude and we saw these descriptive elements of these false teachers that had entered the church? Wandering stars. They look impressive for a little while, but they're totally void of any true substance whatsoever. It just disappears. You love to see shooting stars at night. You look up and all of a sudden, whoa, that was incredible. And like that, it's gone. There's nothing left. Completely empty. Notice the context of 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. The context is 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Where Timothy is writing, I'm sorry, Paul is writing to Timothy without controversy. Great is the mystery of godliness. I'm just going to focus on this next phrase. God was manifest in the flesh. Then we come down to chapter 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing, deceptive, planos, spirits, and doctrines of devils. Notice the context. This ties in with John's warning because these particular false teachers were denying the very deity of Jesus Christ. John doesn't use the word planos in the Greek, many deceivers, wanderers, strayers by accident. They've strayed from the body of truth. They're not walking in the sphere of truth. This is love that we walk after his commandments. Well, John reveals the permeation of false teachers, many. He reveals the subtlety of the false teachers. They are deceivers. Now he reveals the claims of these particular false teachers. They confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. You see, in this particular situation, these false teachers were denying that Jesus was God in the flesh. This was the Gnostic heresy that John dealt with so clearly in his first letter. Gnosticism took various forms. We looked at it up in our fall retreat as we considered the first few chapters of 1 John, but essentially it denied the fact that God could have come in the flesh because matter, it teaches, is inherently evil and spirit is inherently good. It denied the incarnation. In addition, it also taught that only a select few had the the really necessary secret knowledge to become saved. Only a select few, and of course, those who are propagating them are one of the select few. The common man couldn't know for sure whether he had knowledge or not. Salvation was based only on secret select knowledge, so their theology was void of the cross, void of the resurrection, void of forgiveness of sins, void of love for others. If we could boil it all down, the Gnostic heresy went something like this, I'm special and select. Therefore, I've been blessed by enlightenment and you haven't. I've got it. You don't. Therefore, it caused all kinds of uncertainty in the hearts and minds of people. You see, already in the first century church, the Christians were met with an onslaught of false teaching concerning the person of Jesus Christ and therefore of Christianity in general. And of course, those who were spreading this false teaching caused doubt and confusion in the minds of believers. And that doubt and confusion only frustrated the believers' fellowship with God and with one another. That's why John wrote these letters. False teaching or false doctrine leads to errant behavior, and that's so clear. Gnosticism often validated a lifestyle of of license in living. In other words, because the flesh is inherently evil, there's nothing you could do about it, then anything goes. Didn't really matter how one lived or, or what one did. Gnostics were apparently, in the first century, pushing the view that you could live in sin in the flesh and fellowship with God in the spirit at the same time. You hoped you could gain select and secret spiritual knowledge, and you only looked out for number one. You looked out for yourself. Love for others played no part in this worldview. Well, this extremely narcissistic and self-centered view of life is very much like what we have today. 
And it starts with a false teaching and understanding, false doctrine of who God is and that God manifests in the flesh is Jesus Christ. Now, keep in mind, this was only one aspect of false teaching that was existing in the early church in the first century. Just one. Throughout the New Testament, we're told of other errors time and time again. Other errors over and over. The doctrine of the resurrection, the doctrine of the rapture, the doctrine of salvation and sanctification, the doctrine of the church and its distinction from Israel, etc., etc. All of these things are spelled out in the New Testament as areas in which there is a plethora of false teaching. Any defection from the truth once delivered, as we're going to see next week, is to be rejected. Rejected. So John has revealed the permeation of false teachers. Many. The subtlety of the false teachers. They're deceivers. The claims of the false teachers. Well, Jesus didn't really come in the flesh. Jesus Christ wasn't really God. Finally, John reveals the standing of these false teachers in the latter part of verse 7. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. A deceiver and an antichrist. I want to look at this more next time because we have to understand here that John is revealing the fact that they were deceivers. They had the very same spirit of all who were opposed to the doctrine of of Jesus Christ. This isn't a reference to the Antichrist who will set himself up to be worshipped as God, but these individuals had the spirit of one opposed to the very person or nature of God manifest in the flesh. They deny that Jesus Christ was God incarnate. Go back to 1 John chapter 2. We see this in 1 John 2. First, John already dealt with this in a letter, the earlier letter he wrote, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18. John said, little children, it's the last time. As ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, the Antichrist shall come. Even now there are many Antichrists whereby we know it's the last time. Now this is very important to grasp for next week, verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One. John writes these believers who were just being so beaten down by these Gnostic heretics. I've not written unto you because you know not the truth. John is telling them, but because ye know it. You do know the truth and no lie is of the truth. Who's a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He's Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you which ye've heard from the beginning. See this plea? Because I love you, I'm warning you. I'm warning you. The standing of these false teachers is that of a deceiver and an antichrist. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and the Father. This is the promise that he promised us, even eternal life. Notice what he says. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. The deceptive false teachers that are coming in and saying, oh, Jesus Christ isn't God. I mean, it's not impossible for Jesus Christ to be God. Uh, some of us have some secret secret. Select special knowledge that, that we have and not all of you have. And, and we know how to rise above and, and, and we, can, we can have a knowledge of God in relationship with him through our super spirituality, our super secret spiritual select specialness. And John is saying, I'm writing to you about these seducers, these deceivers. These are antichrists. These are deceivers. You know the truth. You can know you have a relationship with God. You can know it 100%. And it begins, it begins with, it just starts with recognizing the fact that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Come to take away the sins of the world. Your sin, my sin. Trust in him and what he's done for you, for your eternal well-being. And you can have a relationship with the one true God. John is just hammering that home in his first letter. And now as we come to the second letter, John is saying, yeah, you need to show love. You need to show love to others, but showing love must always be based on the truth and understanding and a living out of the truth. 
walk in the sphere of truth. These false teachers are deceivers and they're antichrist. And we'll look at that more next time. And kind of John's plea for a response for these believers, how to deal with these false teachers. But John is, he, he, I mean, he's, he's, he's not cutting corners here. He's showing and demonstrating biblical love for these people by warning about these false teachers and their damnable teachings and their heretical teachings. John says, I love you. I love you. I need you to know many a deceiver has entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. And I'm letting you know this is a deceiver and an antichrist. I'm warning you. Watch out. Watch out. Well, like I said, started out positive. The first several studies, because the first several verses, I'm thankful for the way the Apostle John lays this out. He, he, uh, he, he starts out very positive, and, and he starts out with this wonderful unity of truth and the joy of truth. And yet at the same time, he comes to the reality here that you know what that means, though? That unity and joy? It means, I mean, truth is something worth fighting for. It's worth fighting for, so... So let's take this seriously. Let's not just walk around and have this happy-go-lucky attitude toward anybody who calls Jesus Lord or says he loves Jesus. We can, we can worship with them. We can unite with them. We can accept them. We can let them. We can minister alongside them. We can let them come teach. John says, love for others must be based upon truth, the truth of God's word. We want to make much of the Lord. We want to make much of his word. It's not going to be popular it's not going to make us the most popular people or the most popular church in Fresno or the world. But at the same time, we say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your love for us so much that you not only died for us on Calvary's cross, paid the penalty for our sin, but then even as Lord, those who have received your free gift of eternal life, thank you for giving us your word so we can, we can know you more and, and, and we can walk in a way that brings joy joy to others and, and joy in our own lives. Lord, we thank you for the warnings. We thank you. We just pray, Lord, that we might say, help us to heed them and in humility and love, live them out in our own church, in our own lives. Heavenly Father, thank you for the time you've given us to consider this verse. Lord, we are thankful for the warnings you've given us in your word. Help us not to be deceived by the many false teachers within the church who exist and the even many more people who follow them. Lord, may we be individuals who humbly say, teach us, use us, Lord, for your glory, for your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.